U.S. Marnish Radio is part of designnetwork.org, exclusive architecture and design podcasts reaching creative listeners worldwide. Hi, this is Haley Tuck. I'm so excited to show you my new EP, Coquette. And you're listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. In our ongoing series, Children of Genius, we've spoken with Raymond and Dion Neutra, sons of Richard Neutra, Guillaume Schindler, great-grandson of Rudolf Schindler, Randy Koenig, son of Pierre Koenig, Susan and Eric Saarinen, children of Aero Saarinen, Eric Lloyd Wright, that would be the grandson of Frank Lloyd Wright, Emily Ain, daughter of Gregory Ain, Celia Bertoya, daughter of Harry Bertoya, Eames Demetrios and Carla Hartman, grandchildren of Charles and Ray Eames, Erica Fometer, granddaughter of Walter Gropius, and Annie Gwathme, daughter of Charles Gwathme. Wow, a lot of people. Yeah. Today, we reach out to Palm Springs, California to talk with graphic designer Gary Wexler, son of architect Donald Wexler, and ophthalmologist Eric Williams, son of architect E. Stewart Williams. Later, George chats with the new National AIA president, Peter Exley, of Architecture is Fun. And finally, we enjoy some jazz with the lovely Connie Evingson. And now, your host with just over 103 followers on Instagram, Mr. Modernism, George Smart. Thanks, Tom. I do love our 103 Instagram followers. And keep in mind, those 103 are spread across three Instagram accounts. Oh, my. U.S. Modernist, NC Modernist for our North Carolina fans and houses, and Mr. Dot Modernism, where I give away wonderful architecture books just about every week. I've given away over 100 beautiful, expensive, and often super heavy coffee table books since the start of the pandemic. And it's old school entry, just like on 1980s FM radio. You actually have to use your phone as a phone to call in. <laughs> no texting allowed. The books are great, and I love talking to listeners from around the country and the world. The rest of the week, our social media manager, Trevor O'Donnell, does a great job getting out the posts. We've also got a U.S. Modernist newsletter that goes out every Monday. To sign up for it, go to the usmodernist.org site or text MODERNIST to 22828. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by... Wendy Robineau and Don Beskind, and by modernist realtor Angela Roll. In a classic tale that we are largely making up, realtor Angela Roll trained with the Navy SEALs, the first woman to complete the grueling program. On a mission to England, she infiltrated a royal wedding, but after accidentally spilling a bottle of Chateau Margaux 1787 on someone's mother, who had a crown, her military record became classified, and she was burn notice to Prague in the Czech Republic. Broke, with only a 9mm Ruger, a circular saw, and a red ball gown, she studied architecture by day and built portable dance floors by night. It was on one of her dance floors, at the Finnish embassy, that she waltzed into the arms of international man of mystery, Eric of Helsinki, whom she later married. Now she's a leading modernist real estate agent with architecture training, advising buyers and sellers of modernist houses on everything from appropriate renovation to getting your circular saw past customs. Angela Roll is your special agent. Reach her at AngelaRoll.com. That's R-O-E-H-L or 919-995-0550. Thank you, Tom. Architect Donald Wexler graduated from the University of Minnesota in 1950. He moved to L.A. to work for Richard Neutra. Then he moved to Palm Springs in 1952 to work for William Cody. Soon he and Richard Harrison set up Wexler and Harrison. And in 1960, the George Alexander Construction Company hired them to design a neighborhood of prefab all-steel houses that became internationally acclaimed. Wexler practiced in Palm Springs for almost six decades, designing houses, schools, hotels, banks, and even the Palm Springs International Airport. He's on the Palm Springs Walk of Stars, right in front of a building we'll talk about later on. 
Don's son, Gary Wexler's career in graphic design has focused on art, architecture, and architectural preservation. He worked in his dad's studio and also for the Palm Springs Museum of Art, and currently as Gary Wexler Design. Welcome, Gary. Hi, good morning. Architect E. Stewart Williams, where the E is for Emerson, graduated from Cornell in 1932. After travel in Europe where he met his wife, he began work in Raymond Lowy's office on projects for the 1939 New York World's Fair. In 1941, he returned to Palm Springs to work for his father's architecture firm. Williams shot to fame designing a Palm Springs modernist house for Frank Sinatra. That's the one where Ava Gardner got mad and threw a bottle at him in the bathroom. Don't worry, you can Google all of this. He also designed the Palm Springs Museum of Art, and he's also on the Palm Springs Walk of Stars. His son, Eric, is a retired ophthalmologist. During Eric's residency in Vancouver, he found time to visit with his parents, friends, the Kerners, which was great luck as he married their daughter, past podcast guest, Sydney Williams. I didn't know that. Yeah. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. So, Eric, uh, before we get started, I need you to do something for me. Would you please look straight ahead? Can you do that? Yes. Okay. All right. Which is clear, this one or this one? They sound about the same to me. Try it again. (laughs) (laughs) One or two? They're the same. Okay. Well, I've always wanted to do this for an ophthalmologist. Then we've already stumbled on the perfect (laughs) prescription. Just that we must be really good radio ophthalmologists. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So, Eric, fortunately, all our years of medical training tells me that you are nearsighted, and we have a fix for that. Because in 1995, you were one of the first five doctors in the U.S. to conduct clinical trials of laser eye surgery with the light blade, which is a terrible name for something you put in your eye. What was that all about? How did this technology come to pass? Well, it was uh, invented by a Chinese doctor by Shui Lai. And uh, there was a New York ophthalmologist, but I can't recall his name at the moment, but uh, they were able to uh, use a laser to change the shape of the cornea. It was extremely accurate, and I just by luck happened to be named one of their investigators. And uh, I ended up probably lasering about a thousand eyes, all with extreme success, including my own. I'm no longer nearsighted. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I I got lasered and I now, see twenty twenty. Did you laser yourself, or did somebody help? No, no, no. Okay, <laughs> no, someone else did it. That's good. I didn't know if it was a do-it-yourself kit, Eric. No, there wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you must have trained somebody well. <laughs> yes, Gary. I wanted to ask you a first question. Tell us what is this Palm Springs Walk of Stars all about, and Where are all the architects located? Well, the main street through Palm Springs, Palm Canyon Drive, which is the site of both my father's and Eric's. Uh, We have, there are several of their buildings on that street. And one of the buildings was the Santa Fe Federal Bank that E. Stuart Williams had designed. And at the time, it wasn't a bank building, but the stars, which were, kind of mimicking what was done in the Hollywood, you know, for celebrities. We started putting local celebrities, their stars on the sidewalk. And the architects and interior designers, Julius Schulman, their stars ended up in front of the E. Stuart Williams Bank building. And as fate would have it, that building was reborn as the architecture and design center for the Palm Springs Art Museum. Which is pretty fantastic. I mean, it's a great reuse of the building. And you get to see all these stars out in front of it connected to architecture. That's right. And when my father's star was put there, um, my father was there to receive the honor. And it's always quite an experience uh, and brings back a lot of memories. And it's very humbling to see my father's star as well as E. Stuart Williams' star, you know, in the, in the pavement in front of the museum building. If I remember correctly, is the gift shop located in the vault of that museum? That's correct, and it is called the vault. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> Otherwise, you would walk right past it. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool renovation of the building. I think yeah. Marmal Redziner did that? Yes. 
Now, Eric, how old were you when you began to realize that your dad was kind of a big deal? Well, very early on, I was four years old when we moved to Palm Springs right at the end of World War II. And, uh, you know, my my grandfather and my uncle were both architects. My grandfather had come out here in the mid-30s from Dayton, Ohio, to design the, the Palm Springs downtown sh- my plaza shopping center. And then my uncle and my father joined him after the war. And... Uh, I think by the time I was six or seven years old, I was very aware of my father being a very good architect and adored and retained uh, good memories of all the lovely buildings that he, both residential and commercial, that he designed and built. Gary, you worked for your dad too, right? Well, I had, um, in high school, they used to have vocational programs, and I actually had drafting and architecture and I think I had a kind of a built-in advantage over others, you know, in, in those classes. And I, and in high school, I would work in my father's office on occasion in the afternoons. And his office was located not far from the high school. Years later, after I finished with design school, I moved back to Palm Springs. And as I was starting up my own career, I was also working in my father's office. And that was in the mid 80s and saw a lot of transitions happen in the process of the business of architecture and how the production of drawings, I was involved uh, working with graphics presentations of the work and working along with the different architects and draftsmen in the office and saw over the years a lot of changes. Um, I was also very fortunate that during that time I was helping my father archive all of his drawings. And so it gave me a really good sense of the scope of his work. Did your father's office transition to a CAD system or was it all manual drawing? The draftsmen that were working with him, it seemed like a lot of the local architects all came through my father's office at one time or another. And they all had amazing skill set drawing. Originally, it was graphite on vellum, and then it transitioned into ink on mylar, and they were extremely efficient, and they had the skill to maintain a continuity so all of the drawings looked like they were done by one hand. When my father was very involved in doing school projects, and when those got under the umbrella of the state boards, that they started requiring CAD drawings, which large firms out of town must have had a much, much easier time. But at that time, it completely disrupted the workflow of the office. And it was actually the most frustrating time I've ever seen in the office because the technology wasn't there. What used to take an hour or, or, or less to change details on a drawing turned into days. You know, oh, um, trying to master the technology. So the transition to CAD was slow and painful. And um, I know that my father, being a little bit of a technophobe, was not happy with any of that. And it was it was kind of interesting watching them have to abandon a process that they were very skillful and artistic with, the ink on, on mylar, and change to, to the CAD process. It must have been very disruptive, yes. The systems that they had, especially when they were working in school projects, which had a lot of repetitive module units regarding the details, the structural drawings and all of that, they could copy and paste and revise mylar drawings. And trying to do the same thing with CAD was just a very, very slow process. Again, it was just the technology and the people available to run the computer systems at the time was it was all pretty painful. And also it would take like what, you know, an hour to print one page on plotters in those days. I mean it was incredibly slow. It yes. And by the time my father closed his office in two thousand, they never fully transitioned into a fully cat uh focused was production. There anything good about the move over to CAD in any of this for your father? 
not for my father. <laughs> I, I can't really say for the, the draftsmen and architects working. I think overall it was a frustrating process because we're talking about early 90s, mid 90s. The office was extremely busy doing school projects. And computers and, were extremely slow. Yeah. And, and to everything today. slowed down, yeah. Eric, did your father's big break come with Sinatra's house, or was it before that? I think, uh, so as I remember it, I think Sinatra was the big break that made him known. And uh, after that, he certainly designed several other homes, one for William Idris, one for one of my wife's relatives, uh, Leon Kerner. And uh, he also designed and built our own family home. And then subsequently, when my wife and I moved back here to Palm Springs, he designed a home up on Stevens Road here in Palm Springs for us that we lived in with our during the time our kids were growing up. And all those houses are still around, right? Yes, they are. That's wonderful. That's something you can't say about a lot of cities or architects. Yeah, they're identified and, and they're well known. But he certainly did some other things that are, you know, they were commercial or otherwise, like especially the the Palm Springs Art Museum was, I think, really his greatest major work. But anyway, he did a number of other things that were of equal recognition and uh, and very well liked by a lot of people. The Palm Springs Art Museum is a must-see place if you go travel to town for a visit, particularly there during some of its exhibitions or during Modernism Week. It's a tribute to both the art that they have inside the museum, and also they have a very heavy emphasis, as you might expect, on modernist architecture and do exhibits on that from year to year. And now they're considering putting up about 45-foot-high piece of uh, Marilyn Monroe right in front of the damn thing and <laughs> ruining it all. Yeah. So we're part of a committee fighting heavily, trying to oppose the, the placement of that statue anywhere close to the museum. That we don't know what the outcome is. This is the giant Maryland that's 20,000-some pounds and 30 feet tall? Yeah. And, and whose, yeah, um, that's right. whose derriere is facing the museum. That's correct, with her skirts in the back up high. Yes. <laughs> so you see the full granny panties she's got on. Yes. Yeah, I'm looking at it right that's, now. It, yep. that, that, that's right. That's right. So we're facing this appalling uh, intrusion into the beauty of my father's uh, architectural design. Right. <laughs> Gary, you designed something a little more recently as part of your work. You designed the truck that transported Albert Frey's Illuminaire house from New York to Palm Springs. Oh, wow. Um, well, I have been involved with the Illuminaire Foundation. Mark Davis who works, he's been with different uh, preservation groups and he's with Palm Springs Modernism Week. He started a program to bring the 19, I believe it's 1938, Frey designed steel house from East Coast to Palm Springs as kind of um, a metaphor for Frey traveling from New York and discovering Palm Springs and wanting it to be his home. So bringing that to be part of Palm Springs history, to have it, its final construction here next to the art museum building. And just below, where up on the mountainside, is uh, Albert Frey's Frey II, his home, which is also part of the museum collection. So I think it's been since about 2012, maybe, when I think I started work with the Illuminaire Foundation to help with their promotion. And they raised the money, and they acquired the dismantled structure, and they had a truck. And I was able to do some promotional graphics on the truck, including other promotional material that, uh, over the years. I've, it's been a great honor to be involved with any of the projects that celebrate our local architects and help preserve the architectural history relevant to our city. Gary, when did they anticipate completing construction of Illuminaire on the museum grounds? I believe it has started, um, and I think they're looking for this summer to have it constructed. And, I, and the museum, I believe, is also going to be repurposing part of their south parking lot to accommodate the building and 
informational kiosks and make it accessible for visitors. Now, there have been two different movies about your dad. Eric, your dad's movie was called The Nature of Modernism. And Gary, your dad's movie was called Journeyman Architect. What it was like to be involved in those, Gary? Um, Jake Gorst was a very, very talented documentarian. And I believe that his film on my father, which coincided with Wexler Weekend in Palm Springs, which was, I believe, in 2010. And working with Jake, helping supply drawings, family photographs, project photographs, all of that was pretty straightforward. And I re- recall with my brothers and our, our wives sitting with my father watching a preview copy of the documentary. It was kind of mind-blowing. First of all, my father was a very humble guy and would never really accept the fame that was being thrown at him. And when it premiered for the Wexler Weekend event at one of our local theaters with the packed house, for us, for family, it was an amazing tribute to my father to have this this film telling his his story, showing his work, and with his narrative, with his interviews. Um, it was a, just a great, great tribute and beautifully done. There was a dinner following the film with my father and Bill Kreisel sitting together, and Bill Kreisel said to my dad, why don't you just call yourself an architect and not a journeyman architect? And all my dad could do was just look at him and smile. (laughs) He was that humble. That's part of that Wexler humility, right? That's right. Eric, tell me about the the Santa Fe Savings and Loan, which is now the architecture annex for the Palm Springs Museum of Art. How are you involved in that, and how is your wife involved in that? Well, uh, she's really involved in it. You know, she's literally the, uh, was the, uh, one of the curators of art and architecture for the museum, and I uh, was very involved with it. I just remember it being built. Uh, I love the building. It's one of my favorite of his designs, that and the Coachella Valley Savings and Loan, which was just down the street. The two of them were certainly two of my father's major contributions to the architectural world. And this was funded by Beth Edwards Harris, I believe, who's been a great patron of modernism in the Valley. Yeah, I was on the Architecture and Design Council or Board of Directors during the time when when the museum acquired the building. And it was a heavy lift by the people involved to raise the, the money and go through the renovation. And it was actually just an amazing piece of Palm Springs history to reimagine that building. And Sydney had Sydney Williams had worked on that with the committee and for so long to make that ha- that dream happen for her father in law and for the city. And it was it was a huge accomplishment. It's really a key piece of the whole architectural legacy of town is that building. Absolutely. Eric and Gary, thank you so much for, for joining us and talking about your dads. They're really a a very important part of the, the history and fabric of modern design, not only in, in Palm Springs, but really around the country. I really enjoyed talking with you. Well, I enjoyed talking with you, and I, I certainly appreciate your interest in my father, Stuart, and uh, everything he did. I All of my life, even though I didn't end up having an interest, personal interest in architecture, I certainly adored his work and have appreciated it all these years. I, I just want to say that my father having retired in 2000, was able to enjoy the later years in his life as being able to be recognized for his work. And I think the biggest thrill was always when people would want to meet him and talk to him about his work. And so I greatly appreciate the opportunity to talk about my father when I can, because his legacy is so important. And I know it means a lot to a lot of people. So thank you very much for inviting me. You can find all the houses for Donald Wexler at usmodernist.org slash Wexler and for E. Stewart Williams at usmodernist.org slash S. Williams.
Peter actually wants to put some fun in architecture, which is a tough task. Architecture as a field, as a profession, is so serious. If you've ever watched an architecture lecture at a university or museum, then you know the profession can come across as pretentious when it's trying to be inspiring. They really need something like a cross between Frank Gehry and Robin Williams, but that person hasn't come along yet. Architecture doesn't have the comedic potential of even, say, lawyers. <laughs> Although there are some hilarious parodies on YouTube from Mr. Glasses and more recently by Arturo Castro as architect of the world's ugliest buildings, Gerhard Yuck. Fortunately, architect and current national AIA president Peter Exley wants to lighten things up. He co-founded the design studio Architecture is Fun back in 1994. He's managed over $200 million of construction projects and has architecture degrees from the University of Newcastle-upon-Tyne and the University of Pennsylvania. After graduation, he's worked for Skidmore Owings & Merrill, Venturi Scott Brown & Associates, The Architects Collaborative in Cambridge, and De Stefano Gutsch, Chicago. George spoke with Peter earlier this spring. Welcome, Peter. It's a pleasure to be here, George. Thanks for having me. So, Peter, if Steve Harvey asked a family on Family Feud to name a fun profession, no one is going to say architecture. Why is that? I mean, why isn't architecture more fun just in general? Uh, you know, I have no idea. And I think you're teeing me up here to ask me what, what is the name of my design firm. And it's I'm getting there, yes. <laughs> Have I just ruined that for you? No, not at all. Keep going. When I started my own firm, I could either call it Peter Exley Architect, or I could call it Architecture is Fun, which I thought defined a culture for me and uh, for the work that my partner and I were going to do. So contrary to, uh, I suppose, popular opinion, I, I certainly do think architecture is fun. And it's the contract that I make with my clients in my firm. I want them to be involved, engaged, and participate in, in the design process. And there's an intimacy and an enjoyment that I, I think is really essential to that. So for, for me, architecture is fun, absolutely defines our culture and our approach to working on the most important investment many people make in their lives. Now, that sounds delightful, like people would just love to be your client. But you're now the president of AIA, the, the one of the biggest architectural associations in the world, which has taken itself very seriously over the decades. How do you inject fun into this very stately institution? <laughs> well, I certainly take fun or my fun very seriously. You know, as I said, it's about defining that culture. So it's a mental state. It's about looking at the world through multiple perspectives and I don't really think about me um, being an insurgent in a venerable organization. It sort of seems very natural to me that me as a member of the American Institute of Architects, um, I, I guess, can be the volunteer who currently for a year is top of the pile. Um, it's because I feel strongly about our profession. I feel strongly about leadership and service. And I think I have something to offer in this profound time. It's a very difficult time for everybody, and particularly the design profession, as uh, the fortunes of many have changed so much. Sure. When did you start your term? I think uh, the middle of December is when we, uh, we do the formalities of handing over uh, medals and the, the ceremonial thing, uh, which ordinarily we would do at our headquarters in Washington, D.C. But uh, this year, I guess just for fun, we decided to do, uh, well, I was in my dining room and Colleagues from around the country were in their respective favorite places to do Zoom. Yes, we've been a Zoom culture, haven't we? We sure have. Now, one thing I noticed from looking at your website and photos of you is that you have a much better wardrobe than most past AIA presidents. You actually have color in it. How did you? <laughs> how did you? How did you actually develop that great wardrobe? Um, well, the glib and I think funny thing to say is being an architect, I'm very last minute. So when I go to Brooks Brothers and ask for that black suit, they say, oh, they just had a rush of architects in here and there are none left. <laughs> but I do remember as, um, you know, I'm a child of the 60s and 70s. So flower power and paisley shirts were all the rave. And my mom definitely uh, attired me in some fantastic floral attires and I 
I do recall having a, a pair of yellow jeans that I loved around about 1972, I think. So I, I suppose it, it stayed with me. Some of my colleagues have grown up and uh, I've decided to keep my 60s and 70s sensibilities, at least in, in terms of fashion. I was wondering if, if your color palettes ever translate to some of your buildings, if you've been able to use that in any innovative ways. I think for sure, many of our projects use color and materials in a way that reflects our clients, perhaps their, their values and their mission. We've worked with a lot of clients who have children at their epicenter, a lot of places for education. So there is often color that supports a design idea. And how do you use design to help kids? I mean, particularly in this day and age where some are doing remote learning, how do we make that a better experience for our children coming up? I think part of the credo of Architecture is Fun and our practice is to think about design as a basic human right. And I suppose that if we recall our childhoods and experiences in, in places like schools and classrooms, they were often mundane and you, you adorn them with artwork and you know fantastic science experiments, the activities that go on in there. But design doesn't always feature as a central tenant of that. So I think our, our credo is definitely about building an expectation for design rather than thinking about it as an exception and a luxury. So uh, we, we very much think of it of design as something that is part and parcel of everyday life. It's certainly a very noble goal. And the AIA over the decades has always positioned itself to lead with design in the hope that it would solve some of our social problems as well. What do you think architecture will help solve over the next couple of decades? I think anything that we put our minds to have it solve Architects, I, I suppose we're seen by many as the purveyors of blueprints, but as anybody who's worked with an architect knows, we are solvers of problems, we're inventors, and we, we look at multiple perspectives, as I mentioned before. And uh, I think we bring our creativity to the table to solve everyday challenges in creative and exceptional ways. How many members in the AIA now? We currently have about 95,000 members um, okay. across the United States and throughout the world. And there's also an AIA in Australia, I understand. Uh, well, the Australian Institute of Architects. The, yes, and the, <laughs> they're, I think they're the Royal Australian Institute of Architects, uh, perhaps. And then there's um, Athletes in Action. There's several AIAs around. Yep, I think the English soccer team, Tottenham Hotspur, also have an insurance company that is uh, AIA <laughs> adorned on their sponsor shirts. Right. It sort of leads to my question. So has the AIA ever sponsored anything that you know of? Like, have they ever gotten behind an IndyCar or a NASCAR or a sports team? I mean, it's like, go architects. I mean, have you thought about that at all? Now, that sounds like a fun project to get the AIA to endorse a team. George, I am writing that down as we speak. <laughs> I will bring that up in our next board meeting. And they will look at you with horror, I know, but it's, I thought it was an interesting idea. <laughs> I, I will uh, tell them where I got the idea. Your term of service goes a year, right? Correct, yes. And, and what kind of boot camp experience do you have to go through to be president? Do you have to be on a board for X number of years or attend a certain number of conferences? I mean, how does it happen? Is there a, a, a sorting hat like with Harry Potter that picks you? How does it work? That might be one way of doing it. Although I think the sorting hat that I went through, I've been an AIA member since 1988. So as an even younger architect than I am today. And I've always been uh, interested in getting the most value out of my membership. So I've always participated in committees. And uh, if there's been a task force that I could put my mind to, I've, I've been a willing volunteer throughout that time. AIA is 95,000 architects, but it, it, it's our organization. So it, it's all the better for our own participation. And I think that's something I, I've always subscribed to. In the uh, 2013, I uh, was AIA Chicago's president, 
So uh, a, a group of about 4,000 members here in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And following that experience, I got tapped on the shoulder a couple of times to participate in some national initiatives. And so that one thing led to another, and I became a member of the National Strategic Council. That, that sounds really, like a very serious post, like you're in charge of the missiles or something. Well, it's it's about seeing the future of the profession. And AIA Strategic Council is the visionary arm of the board. It, it's the group that uh, is tasked with looking at what the architecture profession is going to be in 2030 or what threats and challenges potentially lie ahead and uh, how the Institute might react to those. So that was sort of my... Uh, baptism by fire uh, to national. And uh, I joined the board in uh, 2018. Sorry, 2017. I've been on the board since 2017. So you, you get to see what's going on in, in that room. We're a board of 16 people. So it, it's hard to hide in the corner. So I, I suppose that's the sorting hat that I went into. And I was elected by members at our convention in uh, Las Vegas in 2019 to be this year's president. So I guess the, the last live conference. Yes, yes, indeed. Is 2021 going to happen this year as a live conference or will it postpone a year? Uh, well, we're not postponing, but we are going to have the greatest virtual conference that we've ever had. So okay. uh, A21 will be a virtual event. Virtual event, okay. Where is it scheduled to be in 2022? in the epicenter of modern architecture in Chicago. Ah, great. So I'll be able to walk. <laughs> That'll be fun. I, I love visiting Chicago. Yeah. As you look ahead to your year and beyond, what do you think are the most significant problems that need to be solved right away? Well, AIA has just adopted its newest strategic plan, which will go through uh, 2025. And there are five imperatives, but the two that are top of the list for me, and I think for most architects, are our uh, commitment to climate action and to catalyze equity. So uh, I think for us to make the strongest commitment in, in every respect to ensuring that the profession of architecture is open to all, that we are a profession of architects that look like the communities we serve with access and inclusivity for all. I, that alongside uh, a real commitment to climate action on climate change, uh, I, I think those are the things that all of us in, throughout society, not just in architecture, must really take under our responsibility. The architecture profession is fairly single-minded of a few things, and I would assume that climate change is one of them. But do you have a number of members who think climate change is not real? It's not a thing? How do you deal with those folks? Well, AIA, you know, we're an inclusive organization and there are many perspectives. And uh, we are a both and organization. The thing that I can say is that I believe architects have some singular problems to the challenges that face the environment and the built environment. We can help consumers, we can help ourselves as business leaders find opportunities to make more money in our firms, to employ more people, and to help consumers, and that's end users of buildings, so homeowners, business owners, school districts, create healthier, better operating buildings that use less energy, perhaps use no energy, through solutions and technologies that exist today. So. Whilst I'm certainly a subscriber that uh, climate crisis is a thing, I understand that there are those that don't, but I, I would trust that every architect for every client can find an opportunity to respond to the built environment in their climatic condition, in their neighborhood, in their community. With regard to equity, you and I are old enough to remember Peanuts and Charlie Brown and Lucy with the football. Yeah. And a lot of diversity, particularly within the design profession, has been like Lucy saying, oh, come on, Charlie Brown, uh, you can kick the football, I won't pull it away. I mean, what's different now about making equity in the profession a real thing, about really making it go? I, I'm, I'm just 
pondering here, trying to figure out whether I'm Charlie Brown or Lucy. <laughs> okay. I, I, I suppose you're alluding to, to me being Lucy, right? You know, L Lucy no longer pulls that ball away in our equitable AIA, right? Right. right. That image is 50 years old. Uh, 50 years ago, Whitney Young came to, or Whitney Young Jr. came to AIA's conference and basically told the AIA that we were pulling that football away. If we haven't gotten around to keeping that football there and, and including everybody in, in that football game, then shame on us. We have made a commitment to actually be doing something about it this time. And uh, I, I'm proud of the stance that we're taking to be more inclusive. We're doing this in a multitude of ways. We're looking at ourselves internally, looking at our own systems. We're looking to advance the entry to the architecture profession by providing more and more diversity scholarships than we've ever done before. And we're, we're collaborating with more and more of our peers. We've made a commitment to work with the National Organization of Minority Architects. NOMA, yes. NOMA. And they are helping us to chart a better path and, and to move forward in a way that, frankly, we haven't made quite the commitment to do before. It will hopefully be one of the legacies of my year in president as, as president, although I'm not naive to think that we are going to make the, the significant change that we're going to make in, in one year. This, this is going to take time. But myself and, and many others that have gone before, hopefully, uh, will be able to stand proud and, and look at a future profession that is truly inclusive and equitable. As you interact with young architects, say in their late 20s, early 30s, what's different about this generation than say the generation you came up with? Yeah, I think I, I reflect on this a lot and I do spend a lot of time with young architects and young future architects. I'm a professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. So I've made that commitment. The one thing that I see is vastly different is their intuitive sense and their intuitive desire to participate in causes that further justice. So when I was an architecture student, I think, I think perhaps me and many of my classmates aspired to be the next star architect, you know, the, the winner of a great competition, the designer of the tallest building in the world or, or some other f phenomenal personal feat. I think this generation of, of young people really look at a sense of social equity for, for everybody. And so they're, they're inclined to be volunteers with, say, um, Architecture for Humanity or to, to be building something that benefits their community. And it, it, it's a less selfish, it's a more selfless perspective. And I think that differentiates this generation in particular. As you look forward to this next year, what are you looking forward to the most? Well, I, getting my sleeves rolled up and doing something uh, of significance, we never know what is quite ahead of us in these leadership positions. And I think certainly 2020 illustrated that to us. We're still very much in this confluence of pandemic, climate crisis, and systemic racial injustice. So I think to be seen to be taking AIA forward and helping society in all of these respects to emerge on the other, from the other side of this triumphally and having seen to have made progress in all of these issues would, would be my goal. And, and, and frankly, I think as the leader, it's my responsibility to look forward to doing that. Hmm. Last question, Peter. There's been a, a movement over the last year in the Trump administration to try to uh, exercise modernism from federal buildings a movement which is still on the books now. Does the AIA support this or not support it? Or what is their position on this kind of style legislation that's going on in DC? Yeah, uh, I think you're referring to the executive order. That, Makes uh, federal buildings beautiful again. Yeah. So AIA is, is certainly vehemently opposed to a one size fits all approach to architecture. We are advocates of the GSA's Design Excellence Program that really uh, looks at the design of, of federal buildings in a more democratic way. It, 
provides regional chief architects through the GSA the opportunity to respond to the climatic and vernacular opportunities that exist in every community um, in America. So we're, we're definitely proponents that we should avoid any official style and that the guiding principles of federal architecture or 1962 decree are, are followed and, and the GSA's design excellence program, which I think sort of ironically came about as a response to heighten the quality of architecture and to avoid the types of buildings that perhaps are um, made a point of in the executive order. So the design excellence program, I think, is something that's admired around the world. And, and AIA is definitely a champion of that. And we are most definitely not a champion of the executive order. And we hope to see it rescinded. Yeah, the classicists have uh, really done a lot of effort to advance their agenda. Most recently, they commissioned a Harris poll, which determined that something like 75% roughly of America didn't like modernist buildings and preferred these classical buildings for federal projects. You know, modernism has never really caught on like a big trend. It's not like it's the Macarena of design, but how do you keep people interested in it? How do you get people to connect with modernist design in new ways? How do you put the fun back in seeing these buildings? I, I always feel as though uh, the most successful projects are the ones where uh, a community member will enter the project on opening day and they'll recognize an idea that they had and, and shared in a community meeting that they were involved in as the architect was brainstorming with, with the community. I think it's, it's finding moments where everybody in every, every community sees something in a building and recognizes it as intended for them whether explicitly or otherwise. And that is not the uh, official responsibility of classical architects, nor is it the official responsibility of, of modernists. It's frankly, uh, you know, the moral and ethical responsibility of every architect. And uh, I, I don't see myself as a classical architect as a, or a modern architect. I, I see myself as an architect. As a problem solver. Absolutely, definitely as a problem solver. And that problem is different on every street corner in every corner of America. Well, Peter, it's been really fun talking with you. And uh, I look forward to seeing the AIA logo on the side of NASCAR. I am working on that and on a soccer shirt somewhere <laughs> near you soon. All right, thank you. George, thank you so much. Jazz singer Connie Evingson did not live next door to Bob Dylan, but they are from the same small town in Minnesota. In a career spanning four decades, Connie has a catalog of acclaimed albums that run from bebop to bossa nova to big band to ballads. Her 10 albums have all charted in the top 50 in the U.S. and Canada, and she's been featured at the Smithsonian Jazz Singers, NPR's Fresh Air and Weekend Edition, and she married into architecture with her late husband, Ross, as one of the Twin Cities' most prominent developers. Welcome, Connie. Good morning, or afternoon for you. Yeah. Before you became a singer, I understand you wanted to be a librarian. How has that affected your recording? Uh, I am kind of an information research nut. I like to know the background of lots of things. And growing up in Hibbing, I remember going, I must have been in maybe second grade or something. And we went to the library. I'm sure we walked because it's a small town. And I remember choosing, I went to the children's biography section and I took down from the shelf a biography of Joe DiMaggio. <laughs> Lord knows Mr. why. Coffee. I wasn't necess- yeah, I wasn't necessarily a baseball fan, but I just looked at it and I really liked reading about you know, who he was, where he came from, and his story. So I've always been a biography nut and just kind of, you know, learning where people come from, you know, what their influences are, what their story is. I love libraries. I still love going to the library. It's my happy place. 
it's quiet and everything you could possibly want to know is there. <laughs> it's fantastic, right? <laughs> if you had enough right? time to, to, to read it, right? The hard copy internet. Do you use a library to pick your material? Oh, you know, I used to, but now, of course, we have at our fingertips all the, you know, way more information than you could ever get at the library. But I used to go to the library to find rare albums, you know. My dad had a great record collection, and that's really how, you know, I I grew up listening to that. And it's why I'm a jazz singer, because my parents tell me I was singing all the standards along with the records at five years old. So I was kind of, you know, surrounded by it. But um. At a certain time in the 70s and 80s, there weren't that many new jazz albums coming out. Uh, there weren't many new jazz artists being signed. It was, you know, mostly the... It was a dark time. The, the, <laughs> yeah, right. So if you wanted to find unusual albums, you'd go to the library. But now we have everything at our fingertips. Well, speaking of the 70s and 80s, this next song was created by Dave Frischberg, who with Bob DeRoe and Blossom Deary were the Peter, Paul, and Mary of the jazz movement in the 70s and 80s. Everyone has a friend in mind when they hear this song. Here's Connie with Can't Take You Nowhere. You knock back the schnapps, you talk back to cops, you walk in the room and conversation stops. I can't take you nowhere. No, I can't take you nowhere. You stagger, you say, you're half in the bag One glass of beer and you're a total drag I can't take you nowhere No, I can't take you nowhere I buy three or four, you mooch plenty more The check comes around and you are out the door I can't take you nowhere No, I can't take you nowhere I don't want to watch you fall on your face song right i can't take you nowhere so i'm taking myself somewhere else <laughs> That's great. dave frischberg's still around isn't he he is he lives in portland oregon he's been there for 
quite a while. I, he moved up there from Los Angeles, and I don't recall exactly when, but that's where he is. I saw him perform in Raleigh, North Carolina, about uh, 25 years ago with Blossom Deary and Bob DeRoe. It was one of the most fantastic concerts I've ever attended. Yeah, I bet. That had to be, what a triumvirate of, of you know, piano players and performers and writers, songwriters. They, they were all wrote fantastic things. There's a line from Cab Calloway's classic performance of Minnie the Moocher about the King of Sweden. And Connie was part of the Twin Cities' hottest local pop gospel phenomenon, More by Four. She performed for the U.S. Olympic Committee, the Super Bowl, and the King and Queen of Sweden. Wow. And you toured with Hot Club of Sweden. So what's all this Sweden business, Connie? Oh, <laughs> well, I'm part Swedish. I'm part Norwegian, part Swedish. And um, there's an American Swedish Institute here, uh, as there is one in Chicago. There might be one in New York. I'm not sure where else they are in the country. But because there is a fairly large Scandinavian contingent here, and um, Actually, the Swedish Institute is in a very interesting building. Tell us more. We love buildings. Yeah, it, well, right. It dates from the 20s. It was owned by a Swedish newspaper magnate. <laughs> and uh, his name was Turnblad. And it was one of the first streets to be paved, I think, in Minneapolis. It was kind of a big, grand Boulevard, and I think he owned the first motorized car. (laughs) I don't know what model it was, but um, he was an early adopter of technology, and so he had uh, one of the first cars in Minneapolis. Anyway, um, it looks like a castle, and um, it has an addition that I believe was designed by Tim Carl from HGA Architects about... 10 to 15 years ago. 2012, I'm looking one. it up now. Yeah, Tim also did the re-renovation of the Northrop Auditorium at the University of Minnesota. And he did another theater uh, in St. Paul, the McKnight Theater, that is part of the Ordway Theater Complex. Anyway, there are an arts institution, a notable arts institution in this town. The reason I bring up the Swedish Institute is because they were the ones, the hosts of the event at which the King and Queen of Sweden, they were there. And um, when More by Four was performing there. And then also there was some kind of an exchange thing and a group from Sweden, the musical group came over and I performed with them And they asked me then to come to Sweden and do some concerts uh, there. So I've I've worked in Sweden maybe a half dozen times. That's how I met the Hot Club of Sweden. It was when I was, I kind of delved into the Django Reinhardt style for a while. In uh, around 2004, I made a a CD called Just Be In My Soul. And then soon after that, I met the Hot Club of Sweden. And we, we worked together in Sweden and they came here and... We did a Django Festival, as they call it. We recorded a record in, in Sweden. Unfortunately, I haven't been to Sweden for, I don't know, about eight to ten years now. Well, it's a fantastic album you did with them. I've listened to it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, there there's um, really strong players all over the world, from Australia to Iceland to Japan to Sweden. There's another group, uh, pretty well-known. Baby boomers bemoan the fact that despite their long fame, there's a sizable chunk of the population who has never heard of the Beatles. <laughs> if you've never heard of the really? Beatles, please Google them, <laughs> because you'll yeah. be glad you did. The Beatles performed this next song on their famous 1969 album, Abbey Road, but it was only issued as a single in Portugal, Central America, and Japan. Paul McCartney, who sang it, really didn't like it. And John Lennon said, Oh, Darling was a great one of Paul that he didn't sing too well. Mm-hmm. To date, the song is one of several on Abbey Road that has never been performed on stage by the Beatles. That's good because I think Connie does it way better. Here she is with Oh Darling. Oh, 
darling Please believe me I'll never do you no harm Believe me when I tell you I'll never do you no harm mm -hmm. Oh darling If you leave me I'll never make it alone Oh believe me when I beg you Don't Connie, where can people reach you and learn more about your music? Well, I have a website, of course. Just ConnieEvingson.com. I am not, I have to confess, very active on social media. So my website or, of course, you know, iTunes, Amazon. Um, you can find all my CDs on Amazon or iTunes. Um, Spotify. Pandora is where um, I found you. Pandora, that's right. I've, I've been on Pandora since they almost started, and it was it happened because I was doing a hot club gig in San Luis Obispo for their public radio station, 
Um, they have a fantastic music festival in the summer, and they hired me to do some a hot club set, and I hired hot club players from San Francisco. And after the gig, the bass player said, "Hey, do you mind if I share the CD that you gave me?" Which I, you know, I sent them CDs so they could learn the music. And he said, "Do you mind if I share your CD with my place of work?" And I said, "Sure. What is it?" And he said, "It's this new thing called Pandora. Huh. Um, it's like internet radio." Yeah, some newfangled thing the kids are all doing. Yeah. Yeah, something that seemed like a foreign idea to me, and um, but then I found out about it and. I've been on there ever since, and they've, they've been very good to me. So I appreciate it. Well, we have loved having you. Thank you for joining us, Connie. Thank you very much for having me. It's fun. I love what you're doing. Thanks for listening. U.S. Marnish Radio is underwritten by Wendy Robineau and Don Beskin, and by Modernist Realtor Angela Roll. And if you've always wanted to go to Palm Springs, Travel with us in February 2022 when we make our annual U.S. Modernist Radio Pilgrimage to Modernism Week at the U.S. Modernist Compound. Just get on our newsletter for details. Text MODERNIST to 22828. Okay, Tom, let's exit the premises. After me. Visit USmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 8,000 significant modernist houses, and access 3.2 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song was performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Rogue archivist Carrie Cesarino researches guests while shockingly handsome husband Adam steals Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus, and Paramount from their aging neighbors. <laughs> just kidding, their neighbors are all millennials and their password, just like their parents' password, password 1234. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive, Incorporated, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. George and I will be back soon with another amusingly architectural Children of Genius edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. Children, Children of Genius. Of genius.